dive into it, I know I owe you a conclusion to the question of um, good soil. We, that's where we started. Um, and I owe you a conclusion because what we have now is a pending conversation. All right? Uh, let me just, I'm just sending the link to a few people. can make some headway. Uh -huh. Goody. All right. Let me know if you can hear me. Uh, let me know if we are on the same page. It's telling me no, the PS or just the PS link. Okay, we're good. All right, <coughs> sir. Let's get this show on the road. Now, um, we're discussing, and we've been discussing good soil, uh, and and um, that's what we want to continue. Uh, we've been at Luke eight. I'm going to jump to Luke, uh, then Mark, then back to Matthew, to draw a more complete picture. Now. Why do I talk about these things? I talk about these things because the average Christian imag imagines that the center of the gospel is the, the ideology of good versus evil. It is an ideology of, of, of uh, 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 not to say that it isn't, but it is an ideology that have, if I've been nice, then when I, when, I, when I die, I will go to a nice place. And if I've been bad, then when I die, I'll go to a bad place. There's nothing that would make life so unfair than for God to throw you in a world full of temptations, in a world full of things you could get, and then simply make it about good versus bad. I, I think that is misleading. In fact, when Jesus came to die, he died to set us free uh, from the wages of sin and death. And therefore, being set free from it, you cannot then focus your life on what you've been set free from. You know, you, you cannot leave prison and then spend your life keeping the rules and principles of prison. It, it makes no sense and it leads absolutely nowhere. So what is the question? The question is what, ought, what kind of people ought we to be? What kind of fruit ought we to bear? So let me take you to John because... I've done a lot on what the wrong uh, soil is. And let us discover what the good soil is, and then probably we can take it from there. Uh, let me know if you can hear. If there are any queries, please do let me know. I'm a bit worried about the way the internet is behaving, but uh, should be fine. Let me just check one second. So, I want to check on my phone. Where did the guy? Ah, okay, good. We've got one can hear, so I can move on. So, in the journey of good soil versus funny soil and things like that, uh, takes us um, all the way to the book of John. And in the book of John, it says a very simple story. I think. Uh, Luke, sorry. Uh, Luke has a very short description. And he says, but as for that seed in the good soil, these are people who, hearing the word, hold it fast. Okay? So hearing the word, hold it fast. Uh, fast is doesn't mean speedily here, yeah, but grip it, you know, uh, to fasten, you know, to, to, to grip it uh, tightly. So they hold it fast, they grip it, and they do so in a just, noble, and virtuous, and worthy heart, and steadily bring forth fruit with patience. Now let us take those things slowly. Number one, they hold it fast. This is, of course, a comparison 
to the first person who hears the word and immediately forgets. This is not someone who takes the word of God for granted. This is someone who grabs it and holds it fast and wants to continue holding on to it. Now, the, 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 the thing that is critical here, again, that I need to describe, is that this is not a word of things. Thou shalt get a car. Yes, God wants us to have good things, but this is not the crux of the matter. It is not what God is pushing. What God is pushing, when God is talking about in this particular conversation, is he is discussing and putting it to us that what he is looking for is people who take his word seriously. What is his word? The compendium of things that are revealed to you. So, for example, if you are revealed to forgiveness, that is word. If you are revealed to uh, kindness and meekness, that is word. If you are revealed to do unto others as you'd want them to do unto you, that is word. If you are revealed to be patient, that is the word. So it's not, this is, I'm not giving you a trick of how to get a car from God. I'm giving you how to become what God wants you to be because the issues of cars and properties, these are things that the Bible is very clear that these are things that are added. They're not things that we seek after because it says very clearly that the pagans seek after these things. So if you want to know how lost you are, seek for things that already exist. Now, why is that the case? You see, if God is your father and he is as wealthy as you imagine him to be, and you find yourself seeking things he already has, that's crazy. So, for example, if you live in your father's house and he has tea, lots of tea, you have a tea plantation, and then he finds you out there looking for the tea that is in the shamba, you will look very insane. But as a good father, what does he do? The Bible is very clear in Galatians, it says, that for as long as the, the heir is young, he is no different to a servant, meaning that God requires maturity before you can access his things. So, for example, if you are seeking a car, and God finds you out there looking for a car as though you are a bit not okay, and he has many cars in his home, then he will ask you why you're looking for a car. But we know that unless you are a mature son, unless you are a grown up, you cannot get a car. So how the kingdom works is very simple, that you've got to start from uh, realizing that God has everything and it is your level of maturity that determines what God releases to you. So uh, to put that in another way, if you want, let me now put it in a selfish way so you understand. If you want a car, a house, whatever it is you want from God, then your journey has to be a journey towards maturity. The more mature you are, the more these things are added to you. So, for example, if you live in your father's house and you really uh, want to be able to drive a car, then the more maturity you show, the more likely he is to give you the car. So what it's talking about here is the process of maturing a believer. Who is a mature believer? A mature believer is one who, when he hears the word, holds fast to the word. He holds on to it. He takes it seriously. He does not, Sir Simon, he does not joke about it. He does not play with it. He takes it seriously and he is intentional and focused about bringing to fruition what the word says. So, for example, when he discovers that if he wants to be forgiven, he must be a practicer of forgiveness, he must practice that truth, then he holds on fast to it. He, he grabs it. He does not let it go. That is principle number one. You have to be the kind of person when you receive revelation, you don't let it go. I don't know whether I'm making sense. Okay? That you don't let it go. You hold on as though your life depends on it. Now, my question to you is, how many of you hold on to God of you hold on how many of you the word that you received is what you build everything around you work your life around it based on the word that you've received if you're not that kind of person then i can tell you here and now that you are not 
going to be good soil and therefore you shall not bear fruit. Okay? You must have the capacity to stick to the word. Stickability. Stick to it. And, and, and this is something that I find very, that a lot of people find it hard to do. For example, if God says you are fearfully and wonderfully made, uh, what does it mean? And do you then take it seriously when he does say so? Or do you assume, therefore, that this is not something that can work? Do you assume? So the question that you've got to ask yourself is how hard do you stick to the word? How hard? It's very simple. And I've seen many people uh, being told uh, 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 you are good at what you do. And then they spend hours doubting that they are good. I've seen people being told that, that, that God is with you. Be strong. Be of good courage. And then they're full of fear all the time. This, these are the issues. So question, ask yourself, do you hold on to the word? Are you one of those people? Thanks. One of those people who holds on to it or is the word something you flip-flop around? Do you build your life around the word? When God tells you that A, B, C, D is what I want you to be, do you flip-flop around it or are you serious about it? What do you do? How do you do it? These are the main key questions. Now, when you understand and accept that, then it becomes very, very critical. Okay, very, very critical to go into phase two. So you've held on to the word, you believe, you've uh, put, you've mixed the word with faith. Now he says, you hold it. And where do you hold it? It says, in a just, noble, virtuous, and worthy heart. Just, noble, virtuous, and worthy heart. What is a just heart? A heart that considers justice. A heart that considers what is right to be done. So I'll give you an example. Some people in church hold on to the word. But they are not just. They will have your, de your debt and not pay you. They will hire you for work and not pay you. They, they will wrong you and not apologize. They will steal from you and not give back. That is not a just heart. A, a, a just heart, again, is the heart that looks at a child. At, so don't, let me not say a child. At a member of the worship team who has recently been impregnated and does not consider it just to kick them out simply because they made a mistake. A just heart. A just heart. Justice. You, 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 your heart is inclined towards what is just. Uh, noble. What is noble? noble? Noble is the root word for nobility. It, it, it is about acting as a royal. In fact, let me use that term. That your actions are noble. So, for example, uh, I'll give you a basic example. If your imagination is you will hold on to the word, you will get a car so that you can show off to everybody who laughed at you in primary and secondary school or even in campus because you could not make it, that is not noble. If you uh, uh, think that you want to succeed so that you can make your enemies see how successful you are, that is not noble. Then you've got uh, virtuous. Virtuous is a heart that is inclined towards generosity, uh, towards loyalty, towards empathy. That is virtue, possessing positive attributes to your heart. And therefore, when you compound these things, you realize that you can have some people who have the word, but they have no justice. They have no nobility. They have no virtue in their heart. That the reason why at the base even they seek God from the beginning is from a selfish perspective that I want something. I want to show something. I want to prove something. And it is from that perspective then that I want to act. And that 
My dear friends, this problem numero uno. You cannot live like that. You cannot be the kind of person who does what? Who is focused on getting things from God. That is not a noble heart. So what happens? You receive soil. You, you receive the word. You hold on to it in the soil of your heart. And, and what happens? You, when you take that soil of your heart and do not have in it justice, nobility, and virtue, then that heart is not good soil. So you cannot be the kind of person who takes the word of God and mixes it with malice, mixes it with unfairness, mixes it with treating people badly, with being rude, with being obnoxious, with acting in haughty ways, and expect that God will give you the desires of, you, of, of your heart that he has put there through his word. It's not going to work. And then it says, and a worthy heart. Your heart has to be worthy. You've got to put your heart on the scale and find out, do I have malice? Do I have hatred? Do I have jealousy? Do I have pride? Do I have envy? Am I a glutton? Am I selfish? All of those things, you've got to expunge them uh, from your heart. And then, when you are able to consistently expand, these are the weeds. The weeds, you know many people have been taught that, oh, you have a car and it's the devil holding your car. Oh, you have a blessing and it's the devil holding your blessing. No. I have met some Christians who are so well behaved, you will not believe it. I mean, they, they, they fast, they pray, they wake up early in the morning, all of those things. But the pride in their heart, the hatred in their heart, their unforgiveness in their heart, oh my goodness, God can't use them. And these are the weeds that you need to root. How many weeds do you have in your heart that ukona mauchungu, yani korayako, you are envious, ukona wivu, unforgiveness, you've got hatred, kuna mtu nampikiria, unakasirika, you know, you're always got remember in Daniel, you are, you are old all the time from, from the time you were in high school. That is an unworthy heart. God can't work with that. I can tell you for free. He cannot, he cannot work with that. It, it is a free thing I am telling you today. He can't and he won't. Your heart, jealousy, envy, pride, gluttony, selfishness, laziness. Oh God, I forgot that one, laziness. Oh, oh, oh. Uh, the kind of people who God says do A, B, C, D, then six years later, it's not been done. <laughs> what guys just me. And then you want God to use you. Sloth, laziness. How many things exist like that in your heart? You know, a lot of people count physical sins. I stole, I smoked. Mm. The true law, because there is no other that should be followed, is the law of love. And the law of love asks the question that am I loving to the people and society I am in? Am I a net giver or a net withdrawer? What am I? That's the question. That's the question. So a worthy heart, you have to practice weeding out wrong desires, wrong feelings, wrong reasons, wrong motives from your heart. You know, some of you pray to God to give you a car so that your ex can see you in a car ajue ni vile umbali umetoka yani humuhitaji motives motives and this is what paul describes in corinthians and says i have not love because you can do many many things for god but you do not have a just heart a noble heart a virtuous heart and a worthy heart you don't have it but you can do many things make no mistake verse 
15, Luke 8, 15, the last part, it says, and steadily bring forth fruit. Steadily. Steadily. Now, there's something here that a lot of Christians miss. The term steadily bring forth fruit. Steadily. Continuously. You see, we have a mentality in the church called Kufika. And what Kufika is, and many preachers fall into this trap, they'll say, I fast two weeks a month, or whichever he considers a standard. Says he wakes up every day at three to pray. Then he says he reads three chapters every day. And he doesn't smoke, doesn't drink, doesn't whatever. And, and that's the standard. But this stays, says that you must steadily bring forth fruit. Steadily means continuously. It means without fail. It means continuously. And therefore, the true work with Christ is to steadily grow, to steadily bear fruit. Steadily. Consistently. And one of the biggest mistakes people make, and, and this is one of the things that you should be very careful with your testimony, is people have stale testimonies. They have stale testimonies. So they will talk about how 10 years ago, God made sure their gas never ended. Their, their water bill was always paid. It's been 10 years. That's the miracle we're talking about. What's God doing now? What fruit are you bringing forth now? Who are you now? What has changed? Paul said he considers what is past cow dung. Waste. Paul also said forgetting what is past, I press on to take hold of that which Christ took hold of me. So are you a steady person? Can we trust you that today you, you did well in A, uh, tomorrow you're doing better in A? So you cannot be the kind of person who's static. You have to keep growing. You have to keep bearing fruits. You have to keep getting better. Steadily. Steadily bringing forth fruit. So, uh, to put it another way, let me just find this scripture for you real quick. I want to find this scripture for you. So that we understand each other. Because I think many Christians are too lazy for what I'm about to describe. And I'm, uh, I am sorry that you are like that. But I've been sent to fix you. So if you look at 20, <laughs> eh, God. if you look at, we are at the end of 2021, when we compare you now and how you used to be last year, what has changed? What has changed? Are you steady? Uh, 2 Timothy 4, to herald and preach the word. Keep your sense of urgency. Stand by, be at hand and ready. Whether of the opportunity seems to be favorable or unfavorable. Whether it is convenient or inconvenient. Whether it is welcome or unwelcome. You as a preacher of the word are to show people in what way their lives are wrong. and convince them, rebuking and correcting and warning and urging and encourage them, being unflagging, inexhaustible in patience and teaching. In season and out of season. Favorable or unfavorable. You need to be able to be the kind of person who is able to deliver. You know, I, 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 I did a post on, on Facebook the other day. Let me just, let me just read it uh, for you so that we are on the, on the same page. Um, 
this is something that uh, this is what I wrote some of you might, might have seen it but let me repeat it I cannot tell you how many times I have done it scared done it broke and done it broken how many times I've done it riddled with this is and this is headaches and migraines lost meaning and all that there was was the mission I slowly learned Instead of telling myself why it can't be done and giving excuses and explanations and reasons, I might as well ask myself, how can I? How can it be done? How can I do it? Because what else is faith for? How do you believe in God and excuses at the same time? You believe with God and excuses at the same time. Because there will be always a reason you can't do it. Can't do it. Hmm. Now let me read for you from the book of Mark, then I'll jump to John. I don't know whether I'll be able to finish. Because I want to paint a picture for you of it. He said to them, do you not discern and understand this parable? How then is it possible for you to discern and understand all the parables? So this parable of the sower is how you discern all the parables. All right? This is critical. So, verse 20, that was Mark 4.13. We jump to Mark 4.20. And those sown on the good, well-adapted soil... Are the words who hear, are the, are, the, are the ones who hear the word, receive and accept and welcome it, and they bear fruit, some 30 as much as was sown, some 60 as much, and some even 100 times what was sown. So Mark brings an interesting twist. He says, uh, the ones that were sown on good, well-adapted soils are the ones who hear the word, hear, receive the word, and accept and welcome it. And bear fruit. Whose responsibility is it to bear fruit? Let me put it to you. If you read this, it says it is the one with the good soil who bears fruit. So let us pause and let me put it to you, this to you in perspective. Natuelewani. Success has a formula. It took me a long time to accept that it has a formula. And I'll tell you why it took me a long time. I read books and biographies of many successful people and they would talk about how they did their first purchase, sold it, the art of the deal, the art of negotiation, the art of, you know, uh, 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 you know, Richard Branson's ideas around virgin. I realized the businesses, the strategies, the disciplines may be different. But in all of them, hear me correctly, in all of them, every successful person, whether they're of the kingdom or not, every successful person has a thing called excellence. Excellence. Let me hurt you a little bit. If your house is dirty, you can't run a successful business. I'll tell you why. If you are not good, faithful, and excellent, 
excellent in little, you can't be trusted with much. And a lot of the time we think that it is a little water, so I will get more water if I am good with much. So a lot of you try to be very good with money, and then you expect you'll be trusted with more money. Jesus said this. He said, a little versus true riches. Money versus true riches. And he said you've got to be faithful with one in order to be trusted with another. If you are not excellent in that which is free, do not expect to be wealthy. If you're not excellent with soap. A wogi, when you chaff, you are still at that level of debate in your life. Cleanliness. So, so how will we trust you with an institution? Now listen, I'm not saying that you must clean it yourself. Don't get me wrong, it is okay. You can get a washing machine, you can hire someone to wash, but surely if you are dirty, how do you expect to rule? Excellence is such a small detail. You know, listen, the... the <laughs> There is a verse. It says, what is it a verse? Let me just say it. It's a verse, yes. It says, when the Son of Man comes, Will he find a faithful servant who does what? Gives food to his fellow servants at the required time. Let me read it. It is something that us guys miss eh? bigly. You may freeze. Can you guys see me? Or you may freeze, Kabisa. Regis Scarlett, we are talking about good soil, good seed. Let me know if can you may freeze or you can see me. Are we good? Well, let me just change my data provider real quick. Give me a minute. Let me switch to Safari Chrome. Very quickly, quickly here. this you need to hear I hope I'm helping you guys feedback is welcome so is criticism okay Am I okay? You know, you guys are not telling me whether I'm okay, so I don't know. <laughs> Feedback, guys, to Fadali. Move to switch to Safari Chrome. Come on, you're saying my freeze peer, I'm a disappear. Am I frozen? Yeah, 
ZP, thanks. We are okay. At least one person. To Let me just give me one second. Let me just switch internet. Okay. Guys, are we better? That should be better. Okay. I hope we are good. Is the internet working? Okay. Any ni zipi peke yake anyambia ka tuko sawa. Let's check this out cuz I So let's continue. So I was saying that the kind of servant, because I'm talking about bearing fruit, and, and, and I was telling you how success has a formula. Listen, I want you to pause right now and look at your house, look at your environment, and ask yourself the things that God has given you, whether it is a cupboard, it is a table, it is a microphone, whatever it is, in what state are they? Is it dusty and messy and not arranged? Is where you live excellent? If it's not, then I can tell you the level of disarrangement you have, the level of confusion you have, dictates how much Success you can have. <laughs> uh, let me tell you something. Uh, let me read for you. It's in Matthew 24, 45. And this is one of the scriptures that I read that shook me the other week. When I was away and I've been away for a bit, uh, being panel beaten. Oh yeah, I can call it being panel beaten. Now, 2445. Let's find. You know, people keep saying how to prepare for the coming of the Son of Man. And the world will tell you to repent. And he'll tell you to be nice and sweep floors and wear sackcloth. Listen carefully. Uh, Matthew 24, let me start from 44. You also must be ready therefore, for the Son of Man is coming at an hour when you, when you do not expect him. Who then is the faithful, thoughtful, and wise servant? Who then is the faithful, thoughtful, and wise servant? Okay, whom his master has put in charge of his household to do what? To give to the others the food and supplies at the proper time. Blessed is that servant whom when his master comes, he will find him so doing. good servant, a wise servant, a thoughtful servant, is which one? Is the one who the master has put in charge of his household to give to the others the food and supplies at the proper time. Are you the kind of person we can trust to supply us with the goods at the proper time? With services at the proper time? To kukupatia contract? <laughs> or if you are just in your home 
are there supplies at the right time? Or do you run helter skelter? Right? That you had a party, you had guests, karibu afike, that's when you want to buy and you want to bear fruit in God's kingdom. Let's talk the truth. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Are you a faithful servant? Let me explain to you. And people forget this a lot. When at the end of the age, and I want you to understand what good soil is, you will not be told you sinless holy person. Jesus says what you will be called so we understand uh, and it's just in Matthew 25-23 Matthew 25-23 the end of the age. And he says, Matthew 25, 23, speaks to the guy with the talents and he says, Ma, his master said to him, well done, you upright, honorable, and admirable and faithful servant. You have been faithful and trustworthy of a little. I'll put you in charge of much enter into the and share the delight and the blessedness that your master enjoys what was the terms well done you upright honorable and admirable and faithful servant who is a faithful servant of jesus it is he who received the seed into good soil and produced fruit steadily with patience now, I have taken that term to excellence. Let me explain to you about excellence. An excellent heart is the one that does not settle until things are done well. That's an excellent heart. An excellent heart is one that is disturbed when things are not done well. And an excellent heart is the one that, number one, is willing to settle for mediocre. Let me explain what mediocre is. That you know it can be better. Your sheets could be cleaner. Your clothes could be cleaner. Your ironing could be better. Your house could be cleaner. But you have chosen, in wisdom or foolishness, to give an excuse Oh, it is not clean because I had other things to do. Oh, it is not clean because I forgot. Oh, eh, 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 eh. Because when you think of a master of a household and what a proper household looks like, then you will understand why the queen of Sheba was impressed by Solomon. order, arrangement. Second thing with a faithful servant, and I want you to consider in Matthew 25, the servant who was considered wicked, says, I know you are a hard man, reaping where you did not sow, so I hid your talent, here it is. The unfaithful servant has excuses. The unfaithful servant has reasons why it couldn't be done. And I can assure you, there are reasons every day why things can't be done. It's cold. There is too much homa, flu in Nairobi. There is a lot of reasons every day 
why it can't be done? The saddest thing is when one who has the power of God living in their hearts believes in excuses more than they believe in God. There's this parable I like to speak of. And it goes like this. A king was to hold a feast. And he sent out word for people to attend his feast. And the people could not attend his feast because they had excuses. One had a romantic excuse. He had just married a wife. The other one had a field. The other one had bought a cow. At least these guys had acquired something before they gave excuses. Many people listening to me have nothing yet. They have many excuses. Many reasons why it can't be done. Unfaithful servants. Faithful servant is like Eliezer who in going to a foreign land to look for a wife for Abraham's son Isaac. He could not return to his master without completing his mission. Couldn't. Just could not do it. Now my question to you then is how many excuses do you have? How many reasons do you have? and I'm not talking about for not starting a business I'm talking about for your house being dirty for there being no order in your life if there is no excellence there is no success why do I say this let me tell you a story where, where this thing hit me like like a storm we call developed nations with Africa. I always ask myself, what is it we lack? But the first thing about developed nations is order. First thing. When you press the button, the button does what it says it will do. You get to the red light, all the cars do what the red light says it should do. The poverty in Africa is brought to us because we don't like excellence. Let me speak about Kenya. We don't like it. We don't drive with excellence. We don't. And how can you then be trusted with true wealth if you're not excellent with what is free? If you like clothes and you're like, one day I'll wear the best clothes. Question is, are your non-best clothes clean? Amoko na kipai kiangu cha. When you say, God, I want you to give me a lot of resources to manage. And then you're the kind of person you go to your cupboard to cook. You wanted to cook sausages, but they ran out a week ago. You didn't even notice. If you're not excellent in that which is free and you have excuses in the manner of service you have, I'm sorry to hurt you, bad soil. You can be very good, by the way. You are meek. You don't insult people. You don't steal. You don't do all of those things, but your life will be fruitless.
And that's what it means to be obedient unto death. It means, it doesn't mean that you're going to get crucified. The devil became clever. It means that whatever, you see, to be obedient unto death, it means whatever task you are given to do, you are so committed to doing it that even though it kills you, you must do it. That's what that term means. How many excuses do you have in your life? How many reasons do you have for not doing what you're supposed to do? How many explanations can you give for missing the mark? How many? As many excuses as you have, as many reasons why the true promise of God in your life is missing. You see, as I conclude, I want to say this. At the end of the age, we will be judged according to the things we have done. And a lot of the time, you think you will be judged for the time you smoked weed, the times you did what? No. Paul says in Corinthians that our works will be put through the fire. What we built, what we did, not what we didn't do. That's what you'll be given a prize on. In other words, Richard Branson will be judged on how he built Virgin. Was he kind? Was he profitable? Jeff Bezos will be judged on how he's built Amazon. Did he build it on solid ground that his servants were treated well and fed well and didn't have to pee in bottles? He'll be judged. That it is his works, what he has, his total output that will be judged question to you is what have you built or you live in a city of excuses you've built excuses reasons why it cannot be done because God is hard reaping where he did not sow because surely if you're such a nice person why wouldn't God prosper you the question is very simple really are you excellent in what you do can we find excellence in your life? Or you're just thrown together, exposed but still from a village. Yeah, I know that sounds classist, but I'll tell you, there's a blind man that Christ made to see and then he told him, don't go back to your village. So I'll tell you the same thing. Don't go back to the village. Become excellent. See you guys next week.